we're going to talk about the different quadrants and how you can divide the abdominal cavity into four quadrants. If you have pain in a certain quadrant, it can help you determine what the underlying disease process is. For example, the liver's in the upper right quadrant. Pain in the upper right quadrant could be something going on with the liver. For example, hepatitis. Hepatic means liver. Itis means inflammation. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. If someone has hepatitis, they'll present with this pain in the upper right, right quadrant. They'll also have another hallmark symptom is jaundice, which is where a yellowish tint develops in the sclera or the white part of the eye. It can get bad enough that the skin even becomes yellow. But this is due to bilirubin uh, being elevated in the blood. One of the many purposes of the liver is to metabolize bilirubin. Bilirubin is a byproduct of red blood cell. It's being broken down and there's this pigment uh, that get, needs to be metabolized. And if it's not metabolized by the liver, it gets elevated in the blood. This tells the medical professional that uh, the liver is not working properly. And then they can have other symptoms like nausea and vomiting, stuff like that. Another pathology that can happen up there in the right upper quadrant is gallstones. So gallstones can develop in the gallbladder, which is right up underneath the liver. You can't see it in this picture, but it's right up underneath the liver. So there's the gallbladder. Gallstones can be produced in the gallbladder. Uh, um, the gallbladder actually holds a substance called bile, and bile is created by the liver, and it's stored in the gallbladder, and it's used to help us digest fats, to help emulsify fats. And down there in the bottom left, you can see that is the small intestines. The small intestines, uh, the first part of the small intestines where we do a lot of our breaking down or digestion of our food, and one key component to that is bile. And whenever we have a, a fatty meal, like a cheeseburger and fries, the gallbladder has smooth muscle in it. That smooth muscle will contract and push that bile down those ducts and empty out into the small intestine. Um, the gallstones can take place inside the gallbladder. It can right there as it exits the gallbladder. And you can see anywhere in those ducts so the cystic duct comes right off the gallbladder and it's called the cystic duct because the gallbladder is also known as the cholecyst and removal of the gallbladder is called a cholecystectomy and they'll do that if you have a, a gallstone right there um, and then as you get further down it could get lodged right there as it enters the small intestines and that can be really bad because not only does it block the bile into the small intestine, but also the pancreatic juice. And this is the major cause of uh, pancre pancreatitis is that gallstone getting lodged right there in the common bile duct and uh, pushing back any kind of contents from going into the small intestine from the pancreas as well. The right lower quadrant is where the appendix is located, and the appendix is a little piece of um, colon that uh, can become in, uh, inflamed. That's the first part of the large intestine or colon, and um, when that becomes inflamed, it's an emergency situation because if that burst, you're going to have all that bacteria that we like to keep inside of our intestines spread into the abdominal cavity and this can be a major issue so it starts with appendicitis and hopefully you have surgery to remove it before it actually ruptures and causes uh, sepsis or all that bacteria to to uh, spread through the abdominal cavity we have different serous membranes and serous membranes are membranes that have a watery fluid um, within them and they surround all of our organs in our thoracic and abdominal cavity. Maybe not all our organs. Our kidneys are behind all of that, so it's called retroperitoneal. But for the most part, 
our organs are covered in these serous membranes. In the thoracic cavity, we give them their own individual names. For example, the heart, uh, we call that the pericardium. Para means around, cardio means heart. So the covering around the heart is called the pericardium. And as you can see in that top picture in the top left of your screen, uh, that fist going into a balloon, it actually is open on one end and forms two layers. And during development, for example, our heart will kind of push into this, this serious balloon top structure and then the membranes will just wrap around the organ. When that happens, it gives you two layers. There's a layer that's closest to the heart. We call that the visceral per pericardium. Viscera means organs. And so that's the one that's closest to the organ. Next, the one outside of that, the second uh, membrane is the um, parietal pericardium. And the, with the lungs, we have the same situation. We have uh, the membranes around the lungs. You have the ones that's closest to the, the lungs. We call that the visceral pleura. And the ones on the outside, the parietal pleura. There's actually a little potential cavity between these two layers, and that's where some serous fluid is located. Over there on the right side of the screen, this is in our abdominal cavity. So underneath our ribs, we have our diaphragm. Under all that is our abdominal cavity, and every organ in the abdominal cavity has a serous membrane, and it all has the same name, which is called the peritoneum. Right close to the organ itself, we call it the visceral peritoneum. And then the second layer is the parietal peritoneum. And if you have a rupture of your uh, appendix, this can cause peritonitis or inflammation of these, these membranes. And that can be a very serious complication because it can cause sepsis, which is you know the spread of infection which can cause septic shock, which, where the blood pressure decreases to the point where we can't get, get perfusion to the brain or, or heart. We can also get irritation of the membranes around the lungs, and this is called pleurisy. A lot of times you can have a lung infection, such as pneumonia or tuberculosis. These are bacterial infections that kind of spread that inflammation on over to the, the pleural membranes, both the for, visceral and parietal pleural membranes. And these can uh, cause uh, a friction rub that you can hear with a stethoscope. And um, it just causes a lot of pain, especially with inspiration. So this can be a complication to those bacterial infections. Sometimes you can have an injury to the chest, maybe a blow to the chest from a steering wheel. Uh, there's other situations where you could also have uh, pleurisy. This is the pericardium, and that's the covering around the heart. And I've worked uh, for a little while in an OR where I would recover these tissues for uh, different surgeries. So we would take a lot of tissues out, you know, if someone was an organ donor and they passed away. And this, this membrane around the heart, it looks just like that first picture on the left where it's a real stark white and fibrous type tissue. And I believe they use them for certain uh, dental procedures and stuff like that. But uh, that's one tissue we would always take. We would always take the heart too. In my case, we would take it just for the heart valve so there wasn't perfusion to the heart. And uh, the pericardium, as you can see on the right, if you have irritation of those pericardial membranes, it can cause effusion or swelling into the uh, the pericardial cavity, and this will cause pressure on the heart. We call this cardiac tamponade. And this can be an, a life-threatening situation. If your car, heart can't expand, you're not gonna get enough cardiac output out there to the body to perfuse all the tissues. So they wanted to perform a thoracocentesis where they put a needle in between those membranes and, and drain that out uh, and then treat the underlying cause. For example, uh, you can have this pericard par pericarditis after a heart attack, or it's also called a myocardial infarction, um, open heart surgery, some kind of uh, viral or bacterial infection. There's, there's several different causes, but 
you want to figure out what the cause is and treat that. But um, first and foremost, you want to make sure you get that, that fluid pressure off the heart so it can expand.